really excited to hear uh, your your view of of um, this particular moment in history, as well as um, how you personally go about uh, transforming uncertainty into action. Um, so thanks again for being with us, and over to you. Thank you so much, Sadra and Sina. It's a great honor to meet with you today and the community uh, that is connecting with this message and has uh, been led by the community that was part of your festival. I feel that the visionary artists feel very connected with festival culture all over the world. And uh, this uh, connection is something that uh, is shared because we're connected with a tribe that is global. This is one of the reasons that I was intrigued and um, interested in speaking with you today. And um, this is indeed uh, one of the strangest moments uh, that I have ever experienced. And in my uh, 66 years, I've experienced some strange moments. So uh, New York City is one of the centers of the pandemic, of course, and it's kept everyone very hyper vigilant and um, sequestered. We live outside of New York City, uh, but we're on a uh, 40 acre compound that is uh, enjoyed by now about half of the Cosm crew. Our studio, my wife and I uh, have a studio here and uh, we're here with the crew. There's about 14 or 15 of us. My wife and I co-founded the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, which is uh, also called Cosm. And uh, this is a church of creativity, an art church. A, um, we're basically looking for uh, something that connects us with all people. Uh, and the creative spirit is that thing. You know, love and the creative spirit is really the foundation of all world religions. And it really has a lot to do with visionary art and festival culture as well. And so um, in this uh, sacred desire to connect with the earth and understand its sacredness and our sacredness in relation to the life web and thereby to value hu human life and all life. I feel like New Zealand has been exemplary in its regard, uh, I think, for the indigenous uh, people uh, who have always been uh, strong in New Zealand and have always been given this powerful uh, position. And uh, this has helped to make a healthy and I think right thinking kind of society, which we applaud. We need visionary uh, examples in our world. And so um, I would like to uh, share with you a little uh, show and talk with you about some of the ideas that I've had regarding this connection between creativity and spirituality. So we're gonna share a couple things. You know, the last time uh, I was in, uh, the last time I was in um, Australia was in Cairn 
and uh, it was for the eclipse. And this eclipse festival uh, was a truly incredible thing because I had never experienced an eclipse before. And so um, in that moment, because uh, many of you may have experienced the eclipse, in that perhaps three minute window of the eclipse, what you see um, is of course like a hole in the sky, this kind of the shadow of the moon and this kind of revelation of a mysterious corona. And it, it just reminded me of this moment uh, for the world, which in a sense has become united by a shadow. Of course, in this case, the shadow of death that we all uh, seek to shelter ourselves from by quarantining and finding uh, ways to keep ourselves safe. Uh, but uh, this moment of revelation uh, through the shadow of the corona uh, also pointed to this thing that a friend pointed out to me, that the corona also means the crown. And so uh, you could say that uh, it's relating to our crown chakra and our uh, trouble with relating to uh, spirit uh, to connect our crown chakra, uh, humanity and spirituality. And so those were some reflections. Um, and I wanted to uh, share with you the painting that's in progress that's directly behind me. Now, In January, Tool was going through Australia and they had a recent album that's been released, Tool, the, the musical group, the rock album, uh, was just released last year and their rock album, if you haven't heard it, is quite amazing. Uh, it won a Grammy and the album was called Fear Inoculum. Now, uh, its first words were uh, contagion, I exhale you. And uh, so the second song was called Numa, and it reinforced the spirit or breath of, hum of humanity. And so uh, it had to do with addressing certain political fears uh, that are in the air and in the zeitgeist and uh, this kind of um, overcoming of fear by an inoculation, in this case, of the creative spirit. And uh, so if you haven't seen this amazing and precognitive album of this moment, uh, check out Fear Inoculum. The painting behind me uh, that you can uh, see there is the painting in progress that I'm showing you a little uh, paint, a work in progress shot there. It's a polarized figure, obviously. There's one of them that is yearning for the light and yearning for uh, liberation and for higher development, for evolution. And then there's half uh, that already seems gone. Uh, that is uh, dying. And uh, so there's this fearful connection and, uh, and a yearning great turn uh, toward the light. So um, the uh, Fear Inoculum uh, tour was interrupted by the pandemic. So there's just so many strange uh, correlations here. Um, but what I really wanted to share with you was the light that I think is always burning in each one of us, which I call cosmic creativity. And this uh, kind of poetic way of saying it uh, harkens to Michelangelo here uh, in this drawing that I did at the uh, Sistine Chapel. But we like to think of uh, God as the creator. So God is the divine artist and the cosmos is the evolving masterpiece of creation. And the Big Bang, uh, that 
it's a great theory and seems to explain a lot. Uh, so 14 billion years ago, there was nothing, a blank canvas. And then 13.8 billion years ago, kabang, and uh, then let there be light. And now we're talking about it. So uh, the largest array of uh, the known and uh, uh, visible galaxies, you know, in the universe are just so vastly huge. But the scientists now understand that the universe is at least 30 times larger than uh, can be seen. So we're living in a vast cosmos. And this cosmos uh, has, we've kind of generated the largest uh, visible array and then linked them together. And what you see here are clusters of galaxies, but it begins to just look like neural tissue. Uh, here are the clusters of galaxies connected by dark energy and dark matter. So we can see how it looks like the neural net and like the mycelial web that unites the trees in the forests. So our own local galaxy here is filled with billions of stars and our local sun here, our source of light, if it weren't for the sun, we wouldn't be alive. And we're really only little reflections of this great light planet, you know, on our little earth. Uh, this experience that we've had on earth over these billions of years, uh, we can look back and see that we're extensions of a cosmic creative process. We would not exist if everything hadn't evolved exactly as it had. And so, in a sense, we have a cosmic body and uh, we can see that really God creates everything with love. And uh, these are my various attempts at showing the creative energies uh, and the cosmic energies all connected. So making art aligns you with the cosmic creative force. And we're all artists of consciousness, really. Uh, you have to invent your thoughts. So you're constantly creating them. You can't help but be creative. And authoring the story, the new story of who you are at this time is, I think, what many people in the world are doing. They're having to author a new story and they're having to get in touch with new energies and rethink themselves and rethink uh, their lives. So uh, we are the primary author of that story and we paint our picture of reality. And we like to say that we're sacred mirrors of this cosmic creativity. So creating with love aligns you with this cosmic creative force with God and with a host of other spiritual forces. And uh, so visionary art, which is the kind of art that um, I like to talk about and I like to create, um, it embraces the span of art history and embodies the evolutionary creative impulse it embeds a spiritual message in tangible works, and you can take art as a sacred path in itself. That's why we're a church of creativity. And visionary art is a kind of materialized theophany, an outer world artifact of an inner world revelation. Beethoven himself said there's no loftier mission than to approach the Godhead nearer than other people and to disseminate the divine rays among humanity. So we connect with our ancestors and family through the mediums of art. And uh, my friend Bond playing the guitar here. This is the music of liberation. It breaks us free of our limited self. And when we say art is religion, uh, it's something that connects us directly with uh, the, the source of creativity. 
And I believe that an artist is always working with a celestial hierarchy of angels. And it depends on, uh, really, and comes to stand for our transcendental creative source, the visionary imagination. So the arts link us directly with uh, this creative spirit and you objectify your subjective state. If you're feeling bad, there's no better way than to kind of offload your emotions than into a work of art, even into a scribble picture. If you, if you think that there, you know, it's a way to get out energy. And so uh, this, this kind of objectifying of the subjective state allows you to get outside of that subjective state, to be objective about it, and to put it in a new context. And so uh, uh, all of the religions have sacred art. Uh, so you're connected with all world religions, really. If art is your religion, then you have to really embrace all the world religions because they all have sacred art. So, um, <clears throat> and, and I believe that religions are all expressions of the one true spirit of love that's creating the cosmos. So here there's a little uh, vision crystal in the heart of this person, which stands for a, a kind of the visionary experience that they're having inside. And then they think about it as an artist. They're trying to think about how are they going to cre present it? What are they going to do with it? So they have to come up with a medium. So a lot of different people have different kinds of medium. You know, you're using the Zoom as a medium today to reach a new audience. So uh, there's a lot of different ways of having a medium. Uh, and we think sometimes that it, it has a, an aura of divinity when we really find our, our true medium. You know, we feel like if we're being given something special. And then, it allows us to make that inner world visible in the outer world. And so this is an early uh, version of the vision crystal. Now we also like to uh, say that you can study the masters. Uh, and these masterful works of uh, art connect us with a kind of feeling wisdom. And you can connect with this uh, sense of mastery when you study a master work. And I like to draw them that way you really understand the forms. So uh, I've gone all over the world with Allison and we like to draw in museums. Michelangelo is my favorite. Now, uh, cosmic art started to happen when we started to see galaxies. And this is the first drawing of a galaxy that was seen, a whirlpool galaxy. And uh, this guy, Lord Rossi, made a sketch in 1845 because they didn't have photography attached to their telescopes, but he could see it, so he made a drawing. So it's evidence of the existing, like a scientific illustration. But you know what? Van Gogh saw that, uh, he saw that scientific illustration and he put it into one of his most famous works of art, Starry Night. So I'd say that this is one of the first cosmic works of art. And uh, so we're evolving toward unity consciousness, where we experience ourselves as cosmic beings, participating in the evolution of the universe. A cosmic body is part of the cos cosmic uh, uh, body. The human mind is part of the cosmic mind. Awakening to this cosmic dimension of ourselves is profoundly restorative. <clears throat> With that experience and understanding, we bring healing to our wounded planet and a new sense of adventure to the human journey. <clears throat> so the environmental scientists tell us we have very little time to shift, as you know. So sometimes entheogens heal souls and it might transform habits of consumption to turn our eco-catastrophe uh, around. <clears throat> I like to mention this guy, Arnold Toynbee, because he studied civilizations all his life. And at the end of his life, he started to say that maybe civilizations exist to give birth to better religions. So what is a religion? Religion, a way to connect, uh, to bind or tie back, uh, to tie oneself to creative source, to the ground of being, to ultimate reality. 
how can you tie yourself back to God? So the practices and beliefs for uniting God, and they they come in so many different uh, sacred paths. Uh, and the primary religious experience, we say, is the visionary mystical experience. And you can see this in all the world's sacred traditions. Uh, the visionary experiences at the root of uh, the Hindu culture, even as a psychedelic, uh, we've got soma, which was probably a psilocybin mushroom. And it uh, resulted in a very visionary uh, religion and which still celebrates ganja as one of the sacraments. So Buddha assaulted by Mara, king of delusion, we have another visionary experience starting the uh, story of Buddha. In uh, the Eleusinian mysteries in Greece, we had the myths that were reenacted in a psychedelic trance uh, that uh, the psychedelic was called the Kaikion. So here we have uh, Eastern and Western civilization whose basis was psychedelic. And, uh, and you could argue that maybe something psychedelic was going on in this forbidden fruit uh, with Adam and Eve. Uh, here's a beautiful painting by Ernst Fuchs, uh, visionary art granddad of the Moses and the burning bush, another great mystical experience that started a world religion. So the Annunciation uh, here, we uh, see the uh, Gabriel giving the message to Mary. Uh, so these are the mystical experiences. Here's the Barak giving Muhammad the ride to the seventh heaven. So we see that the great world religions are founded on these mystical experiences. And uh, Einstein himself, uh, in this famous quote, talks about uh, the sensation of the mystical and that it's the uh, feeling at the center of true religiousness. So uh, one of the people who studied the mystical experience was Walter Pankey, and he uh, came up with a criterion of what constitutes a mystical experience. And then he gave divinity students, uh, who were all volunteers, 30 divinity students, uh, psilocybin. Uh, half of them had it, half of them didn't. The half that did had 65% of them that had a mystical experience. And uh, some years later, Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University replicated his experiment in a much more controlled setting and got the same results. About 65 to 70% of the people had a full-blown mystical experience, God contact with their psilocybin. Now, we can also see that uh, when uh, they made this discovery about the mystical experience and uh, its connection to religion, uh, we can look back uh, 10,000 years or more uh, to the uh, plains of Tassili in Algeria, in Africa, uh, in cave drawings that Terence McKenna made famous. Uh, these uh, Mushroom-headed tykes are bounding across the uh, cave walls, and they're carrying mushrooms. And uh, along in that uh, same cave, you've got a bee shaman-type being sprouting these mushrooms all over himself from a webbed mycelial-type body. Now, these are ancient visionary art, a therian mark, that is a... a human, animal, and here plant uh, hybrid uh, being that is uh, taking in the powers. Uh, so these shamanic uh, images are really some of the earliest uh, forms of religion. Uh, and here we have practically the smoking gun. We've got the uh, little cave paintings in Spain, 6,000 BC. We've got a bison the mushroom and mushroom-headed beings. So this is another example of visionary art predating the uh, kind of uh, known world religions, but probably the earliest forms of religion. And we can look back around to South America, which is the richest, uh, uh, I guess, uh, continent that in uh, psychedelia, and uh, they have a long history with these uh, Guatemalan uh, psilocybin mushroom stones, and uh, which were demonized by the um, 
people, the the conquistadors and the uh, missionaries that came, unfortunately, to the Americas. And uh, so this uh, knowledge was hidden until 1956 uh, when Maria Sabina, or 1955, when Maria Sabina gave the uh, psilocybin mushroom to Gordon Wasson. And Gordon Wasson gave it to his friend, uh, Albert Hoffman. And uh, Albert Hoffman uh, distilled this psychedelic molecule psilocybin from the mushroom. And he saw its relationship to uh, the earlier Eleusinian uh, uh, rites. Now, uh, I have done two paintings of Albert Hoffman because the uh, LSD experience that I had had a great impact on my life. And we feel very fortunate that on his 100th birthday, Dr. Hoffman signed the back of this uh, painting which will be on view at Entheon, uh, the sanctuary of visionary art that we're building at Cosm. Hit on display also, his family gave us his glasses that I painted in this painting. So uh, they will be a relic on display at the uh, Entheon Sanctuary of Visionary Art. Now, uh, he gave a beautiful quote that says, alienation from nature and the loss of the experience of being part of the living creation is the greatest tragedy of our materialistic era. It's the causative reason for ecological devastation and climate change. Therefore, I attribute absolute highest importance to consciousness change. I regard psychedelics as catalyzers for this. They are tools which are guiding our perception toward other deeper areas of our human existence so that we again become aware of our spiritual essence. Psychedelic experiences in a safe setting can help our consciousness open up to this sensation of connection and of being one with nature. LSD and related substances are not drugs in the usual sense, but are part of the sacred substances which have been used for thousands of years in ritual settings. The classic psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline are characterized by the fact that they are neither toxic nor addictive, it's my great concern to separate psychedelics from the ongoing debates about drugs and to highlight the potential inherent to these substances for self-awareness as an adjunct in therapy and for fundamental research into the human mind. It's my wish that a modern Eleusis will emerge in which seeking humans can learn to have transcendent experiences with sacred substances in a safe setting. I'm convinced that these soul-opening, mind-revealing substances will find their appropriate place in our society and our culture. And this was uh, an, a statement given by Dr. Hoffman on his uh, April 19th um, in 2007, when he was 101 years old. My wife and I had a very uh, breakthrough LSD experience which led to the creation of the sacred mirrors. This is a few of the sacred mirrors. One is called the psychic energy system here, then the spiritual energy system, and uh, then the universal mind lattice. This was the dimension that uh, the medicine brought us to, which uh, was a state outside of the body. We became just part of an energy grid, uh, toroidal fountain and drain of uh, light that was also love was connecting us with every other being in the cosmos, an endless web. And uh, this universal mind lattice uh, was uh, something now I've, I've heard many people share. It's going to be on display at Entheon along with these many other uh, works of art. This is called praying and shows the light in the heart that is uh, then reflected in all the world religions, uh, the connection with love uh, and the beloved and the polar unity uh, and what comes as a result in the cosmic family and the promise to stay together for the betterment of uh, our species and our world. The, the new ones coming born today are very brave parents 
and I bless you. And the newborns being born today, may they be blessed. Uh, our children are filled with wonder and they fill us with wonder. And uh, this is what I think is the sacred story, is uh, God's unfoldment uh, through this uh, divine love that is channeled through our families and uh, the communities. And when we see our oneness, we see our potential. And uh, now we recognize where we're at when Gaia, our world planet is under great stress and uh, half is in this fire and half is, is we're just trying to preserve it. So now it's time to cultivate a world spirit, a world soul and, uh, and to unite the polarities of male and female. And uh, this sculpture is called world soul. This is a visual attempt. I, you know, to make a symbol, to bring those opposites together. And uh, this transfiguration shows uh, the alignment with the spiritual force. And this is uh, planetary consciousness uh, becoming cosmic consciousness through human consciousness and finding the oneness, the perfection, of the, this cosmos, this creation uh, reflected in the eyes of the beloved. This cosmic Christ shows that uh, stories connect us all. And uh, there's a kind of global crucifixion going on where all the people are connected. And uh, this is another way of showing that space of interconnectedness, the net of being. And uh, we like to think that the viewer comes in contact with the visionary source through contemplation of the artwork, uniting with the transformative evolutionary creative force working through the artist. So the artist has the idea in the upper right, you know, that's happening on the inside, the vision. You don't see it from the outside, but they're having it on the inside world. And then uh, they bring it out into their studio and do it. And then they put it into the system, uh, the outer world. And uh, then the outer world integrates it. And all of that is the great round of art. We're promoting the sense of world spirit by uh, creating a sacred space to celebrate it. Uh, this is the first chapel of sacred mirrors in New York City. And... Uh, we moved upstate uh, where we're able to build on a 40 acre property. And uh, this is our once large crew. And uh, we do full moon ceremonies. Uh, my wife uh, and Allison Gray, the artist, uh, is a co founder. And um, this many artists have come to uh, make this beautiful place. Uh, we celebrate weddings. We have a permaculture course. Uh, we put a journal forward. We believe that the inevitable consequence of love is the building of temples. And so our community experiment uh, that Allison and I have launched is called Entheon. And it's a sanctuary of visionary art, Cosm. So these are some of the uh, pictures like uh, the creating a, a better world. Um, that's going to be the front door. And uh, we'll have a symbol of the unity of all the different world religions and all these big faces and the uh, visionary angels. There's the sacred language, that uh, the secret language, the Allison Gray will be at the top of the chapel. And uh, these are the large heads. Uh, we have the steeple head up at the top. These are the people of the four directions uh, coming together in visionary oneness. And uh, so we do have that and it's now on the chapel building. And we have the uh, galleries, they're nearly ready for the art. Uh, of course, the big heads aren't on there yet. 
but we do have some of the uh, sculptures ready. Uh, our community has been helping us in a lot of ways. Sometimes they buy an entheurn for your ashes or your stashes. And uh, so one day we're going to build this uh, chapel in the meadow here and uh, we'll move Allison and Alex's art out of Entheon and put it in this large chapel. And then we'll just have an exhibit space for visionary artists from around the world. So that's what Entheon will be, a sanctuary of visionary art to celebrate the um, <clears throat> experience of, of visionary uh, art from around the world. So thank you for indulging my uh, uh, sharing of this uh, cosmic creativity, but uh, this is one of the things that I think everybody has access to, you know, in their own creative lives. And especially at this time of, uh, you know, going within and uh, going, uh, you know, to the, uh, uh, to the root of uh, oneself. I think that that's the opportunity that we have here. Um, now, uh, Sadra, Sina, were there any uh, questions that came in? Uh, have I gone over time? You're uh, no, you're doing that. That was that was marvelous, Alex. Uh, you you definitely uh, blew me away. Um, I'm wondering from uh, if there are any questions or if anyone would like to uh, join the conversation. Um, now is a good time to do so. You can either raise your hand um, or you can type. Uh, questions in the chat or the questions and answer area. Um, and it, I'm just checking Alex to see if there are any questions at the moment. Um, but uh, I'm, I think one, one thing that really stood, stood out for me is um, the authoring of a, of a new story. And um, I'm I'm curious uh, I'm curious as to um, how the the what what has happened in the world recently how that has uh, shifted um, or if it has or if it hasn't um, and if it has in what way um, how how has it shifted what what what's happening in, in your own practice and in the way that you're approaching um, your, your, your art. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, I think that <clears throat> one will uh, really understand that only in hindsight, you know, I think that in the midst of uh, things, it's very difficult to grab a hold of uh, how you're being affected. You know, I, uh, as far as, uh, <clears throat> you know, what my wife and I have uh, been doing, uh, that has changed radically, you know, and yet uh, we're still uh, here at COSM with half of the crew um, that we had before the pandemic. And we're online with all our offerings, just as the, you are going online with uh, your offering to the community. <clears throat> this, is the, this is the great thing that we've got that humans at other pandemic times didn't have was the internet, you know? And so, you know, we're all learning uh, this new evolutionary skill. And I believe that it will permanently change us, you know, that uh, this is a, a time of radical uh, readjustment. And I think that I've been doing a lot more journaling. Uh, and it's a time when you feel like it's time to be serious about your spiritual life. You know, if if you believe that you have a spiritual life uh, or you believe that there are 
um, <clears throat> people you should be in contact with and uh, that you should uh, forgive or, or ask forgiveness from and things like that. It's like, it should be an incentive to tie up our business, you know. Buddha said that there was no better teacher than death. So with the uh, skull grinning in, you know, you, uh, you get really focused on what becomes important for you. And what becomes important for a person is really uh, only after they do some soul searching and only after they come, come to some uh, decisions inside themselves. And so, you know, I think journaling and sketching and things like that are, are really a great way of um, processing and integrating uh, the material that we have. This is a time when not only we see the shadow reflected all on the outside and in the news, but uh, it's coming up in everyone, you know. Everyone is experiencing uh, and getting to see their own uh, shadow as well, I believe. And so, um, you know, those are all things that uh, should make us humble and uh, make us, um, you know, open to the guidance and direction of a higher uh, and spiritual, uh, a positive uh, evolutionary creative force in our lives. And, um, you know, when we keep that kind of focus, uh, you know, and art at the service of the divine, art at the service of love, you know, uh, creativity at the service of love, you know, that's so general, that can be applied practically anywhere you know, and in any way, but definitely working with your hands, you know, draw, journal, and, and drawing can be really delightful, even if you don't feel like you're greatly skilled at it, you know, it's a great way to stay in the moment, you have to pay attention to something and just follow it around, and then, you know, it's a, that's a way to stay in the now. Uh, to uh, to Kana, um, to Kana, um, you feel free to ask your question live with Alex. Well, uh, tēnā koe, Alex Gray, Matua. Um, thank you so much for your amazing mahi, your sacred work. Um, I've been, I'm in my 20s and so your work has been in my life and inspiring me my whole entire life <laughs> so that's really incredible you've been a great teacher to me and my whanau my family um i have a question for you regarding secrecy regarding um the waharoa the gateway to um our transcendence as a as a race and um it really feels to me like the um, the idea of secret knowledge or the idea of initiation um, is no longer needed and that our long, long journey of our trials all the way to number nine um, is done. And now we're here and it's about um, teleportation, matter of factually, anti-hesitation automatically that we're right there now and that waking up is just an opening of the eye. It's instantaneous. And yeah, I'm an artist and a musician, but professionally I'm a teacher and um, my work is trying to remove, not present the gate to people, but remove the illusion of the gateway for people to wake up. So um, blessings on you and huge big love. Aroha nui. Um, Modi order, Matua, thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, I just say ra ra, you know, and uh, that what it sounds like uh, to eliminate the, the gate is to uh, see the beauty of exactly where you are and to recognize that there's nowhere you need to 
you know, seek, you know, mm. it's all, you've all, you're already there. It's, uh, the Buddhists uh, put it like, uh, you all, everyone has a Buddha nature, uh, but they have obstacles to realizing uh, their already awakened state. And what the spiritual uh, path uh, has to do is clearing away the obscurations to recognizing your liberated state. Uh, and it sounded like that's where you were. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I feel like your um, artwork work both helps um, people see that gate, but also removes it for them. And so I wanted to ask you about, especially for children, and it's through creativity and play that we can remove these obstacles for people. Um, but they just, everyone believes, so much believes that they have to get there through something. But I feel like, I really feel that that's an illusion. So I'm trying to make it the work of the teacher to remove that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, creativity and, uh, and uh, basically, uh, you know, courage in the face of creative courage, you know. Uh, yeah, that's what seems to be important right now, you know. Thank you. And good intentions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Good luck with that creative uh, and uh, blessings on your uh, on your work. Thank you, and you. Thank you, thank you. And there's a there's a question from uh, Karina, um, and the the question is with regards to the works for tool. Do you take um, inspiration? See the images from hearing the songs. <laughs> I wish I've never I never heard any of the tool songs before they um <clears throat> well they 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 did release uh, fear inoculum so I heard that a little a little bit before people heard it but I didn't hear the album really uh much before everybody heard it so I had to do all the artwork um without really but, but that's practically been the way that it's always been that I don't really know what they're doing uh as as far as the uh y you know the music goes but uh regarding the art uh this time uh, Adam was extremely generous he did call me up uh and basically uh said well I have a lot of ideas uh but uh do you have a uh a, a work of art that you're uh thinking of that nobody's seen um but that um you know could be part of the uh, album or something and so he opened up this possibility uh of a um you know me working with the uh, great turn which was a commission that i was already uh, working on and so this uh great turn is something that i'm still working on and you can see it in the background here is the painting is coming along so unfortunately i didn't get to uh i i didn't even know uh what the name of the album was and so when uh when you see everything come together uh and you can only feel like oh this was it was planned in the stars or something it was not uh, who can control these kinds of things uh i couldn't have come up with a better uh with something better i don't think if i had heard it but uh it it really was cool to hear it then Thanks, Alex. We, we also have a question um, from Facebook. Someone's asked, uh, what are your thoughts on the polarizing of communities at present? Uh, trust versus distrust of systems. It's never been more extreme in my experience. 
And so uh, that's, I think, why the why I'm doing this painting, you know, about this polarized figure. Um, you know, I work according to vision, so I don't really always know why I'm doing something uh, or why it's happening until after the fact and you really kind of think about it. Uh, but, you know, this painting's been coming now for, uh, for a long time. And, um, in the figure um, is one figure. Now it's a polarized figure, but it is one figure. And so I think that the idea was to suggest uh, a way of, of holding both the most extreme kind of polarization, but also a sense of connectedness. And so in that way to create a, a symbol of sympathy for um, our uh, connection with uh, an extremely polarized state. Also, uh, to put forward the idea, the great turn is uh, to find this, where is the pivot? Because uh, it's a kind of moral uh, pivot point. Uh, that a person has to find within themselves to turn toward the light, to turn toward something positive. And so uh, uh, I think that uh, this is the, you know, the search. At this point, you know, people are, are probably just experiencing a lot of fear, a lot of tension, uh, a tremendous amount of despair and upset. And, uh, and, and a lot of anger, a lot of rage. Uh, and all these emotions, I think, are uh, understandable. They're completely understandable, uh, given a kind of dire situation in the world. And uh, so, um, you know, I think it's, uh, all we can say is that uh, it really pays to uh, to fact check and to uh, background check things and to be a little suspicious of things that get you emotionally upset, you know, because now we know that it's very easy for what seem to be innocent kind of uh, connections uh, to have hidden agendas and things like that. So you feel you don't want to feel uh, manipulated and you want to be wary, you know, to see who might be trying to do something and not recommending you to think for yourself, but to do, do something dangerous, you know. So, um, you know, it's a it's the time when you really have to think for yourself and, um, you know, find a inner moral compass and a way to be steady inside, you know. Uh, I like to talk, <laughs> this sounds self-serving. Uh, uh, there's something called the gray point that I'd like to mention because it's about uh, unifying polarities, see. Uh, you can imagine having like a, uh, like here's a, here's black and uh, here's, here's white, see? And in between there's a line. And so, so you've got, <clears throat> you've got absolute white and you've got absolute black. Now in the very center, in the very middle point is, at, is middle gray. And the middle gray has no opposite. Off a little bit of the gray, you've got a darker gray meets a lighter gray. You've got an opposite. But in the middle uh, of the space, it's uh, the gray point. And this gray point is a perfect medium. It's a, a, it's a symbol of a medium a ship and a symbol of uh, balance within polarity. 
And so I like to think of this kind of cosmic pivot as happening around a gray point where, uh, you know, there's the, just the witness is able to watch anything and everything and with equanimity choose the positive thing. So. Thanks for that. Um, we have uh, a question from um, Vol. Uh, we have a question from Gisele, uh, a friend of ours from Brazil. Uh, what would be your message to the communities around the world who are still fighting for survival and who do not have their basic needs met to then open themselves for spirituality and raise consciousness? Mm. <clears throat> well, It would seem that the most important thing for us to do is to find a sense of gratitude for life itself and to see whatever situation one is in, to find a way to praise God and thank God for what we do have and to find a way to, uh, to pray and to spend some time each day, if possible, in the quiet with just yourself and spirit. And there's no cost to it. It's, uh, it, it takes time to develop a relationship like that you know it's a love relationship and it lasts a lifetime and you want to develop a relationship with god because it's i mean you can just think of it if you don't like that term you can use another term you can use higher self you can think of uh you know um creative spirit you can think of uh, the creative force, you know, there's all kinds of ways of thinking that, you know, I mean, we're in the midst of a creation. So uh, how can you use your imagination, which also costs nothing to imagine uh, how what you like to do can uh, serve yourself and the community at the same time. And if there's some way to do that, you know, and uh, then the value that we find in life is really what service we can bring, you know, to the world. And uh, God is there for everyone. There isn't a special God for a rich person and a poor person it's the same god and it's the same pure spirit that's infinitely intelligent that is in touch with each one of us and uh we're each one of us like like our friend before said uh free already you know it's just we got to get still and find that freedom and uh from that safe space you know maybe angels are there watching maybe you can act, you can invite them the forces of positive good you know to help you and your family and, and community and this is all we can can do and there and then recognize opportunities when they come up and try to follow up on them. I, I don't know what else to do. It's like spirit gives us a stepping stone just each day, you know, each new day is a stepping stone toward a future that we imagine ourselves. And life gives us things that we can't imagine, but we have to adapt to it. And it's because we're just, part of the world, you know, 
and can only make limited impact. And really, um, we we want to be the most positive force that we can. <clears throat> you know, just smiling at people is a, uh, you could say is holding up your end of the universe. Well, how are we doing? Are we, are we good? Um, just one more question we have from uh, Voltania is, um, please tell me if you'd, exper if you'd experienced lucid dreams. I feel as though it is my medium to find spiritual communion and transportation into other realms. I focus daily on increasing an ability found in childhood but some people don't dream at all. Please tell me if you know of yourself or others with that regular ability to wake, walk into these sacred otherworldly places. It feels to me an easier way to find spiritual communion than even in theogens. I... I feel like yeah, you're right. And if you have an active practice of lucid dreaming that's working for you, I have to say bravo, well done. And you must be living right and doing the right thing. So uh, I think that it is, uh, you know, the Tibetan dream yogas, uh, maybe you know of them and things, but they, uh, they might be an enhancement to your already uh, knowledgeable kind of lucid dreaming exercises. Um, and uh, for myself, I had a brief period of uh, lucid dreaming and got to fly and do a few things that I thought were amazing. And uh, then I got into some other stuff that impacts my dreams, I think. And uh, so I have not been remembering my dreams as much. And uh, so, uh, but if you do, and if you can, then God bless you. And I, and I'm, I think that it's an awesome way. Uh, there are a few of my friends who uh, were very much into the dream realm and um, have, have said uh, similar things. So blessings. Yeah, we've got um we've just got another question come through from Facebook, Alex, uh, from Annalise. Uh, thanks, Alex. Could you talk more about what you have come to know about the universal mind lattice and the various atmospheres, layers of subtle material uh, which emanate from human beings? Uh, well, one of the interesting things about the universal mind lattice uh, is that I've found some uh, other kind of corroborating um, reports of a similar dimension. Two of them uh, that were published in uh, psychedelic literature, uh, one of them published in Reader's Digest, an American kind of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, God, popular little uh, journal that was sold in grocery stores and things and quite popular in America. Uh, and it was one of the earliest near-death reports. And uh, so it was by a guy named Victor Solo. I died at 1045 uh, or something like that. And... Uh, so he talks about the same kind of web of energy and being part of that grid uh, in his after death state. He had a, a heart attack. And uh, then uh, it, it, the description is, is uh, practically uh, similar. And every time I post this, uh, image on uh, Instagram, 
I get at least half a dozen, if not 10 other people who've reported that this is where I went uh, and uh, I've been there and stuff. And uh, so as far as what it is, where it is, uh, anything like that, I mean, the intuition was that it is a space that is a spiritual space, not a physical space, uh, an energy space. And you feel uh, it was like a cell, that each, each being was a cell. And uh, there was a circulating light. I felt like that uh, energy cell was the, um, the being that is the library of lifetimes uh, that you have as a soul, that uh, you are basically collecting experiences as you incarnate, and it reports back to the uh, ultimate sphere uh, that you are. And uh, it's a data collection kind of uh, thing, an informing and karmic kind of uh, thing. And uh, so, and, and it felt more real than, you know, practically just sitting here now. It, and, and I don't understand how it can possibly be that something out of the physical uh, could seem more real, but nevertheless, it had that, uh, component as a feeling. Uh, it felt like infinite love, that that was the, the source energy that you ultimately were bathed in and were part of and that you were flowing with, you know, and that everybody was this same kind of fountain. And uh, so uh, that, I think it's a spiritual light uh, and energy. I don't know where it's at. Uh, but it seems to be on a spiritual uh, level. And uh, the and many people have experienced it. It's part of the universal uh, mind lattice uh, is part of the uh, sacred mirror series that we're going to be displaying at Entheon. And uh, I think that there's something of practical value, frankly, uh, in having a mystical experience that has been corroborated by multiple uh, observers uh, rather than simply by uh, one founder of a world religion. <laughs> you know, I hate to say it, but it's there's something interesting about uh, the psychedelic mind that has pointed to multiple uh, visionary art works and said, there's something that I've experienced on my the inside of my imagination, my own imagination, uh, that looks very strikingly similar to that. So that speaks to a, a, a soul similarity uh, that I think we don't understand at this point, you know, but is connected with Jung's archetypes and what symbolism means and uh, the roots of philosophy. All of uh, these things are like, the mysteries of consciousness and the quote divine imagination. So um, it's one of the enduring subjects of visionary art, this subtle body, you know? All right. Thanks, Alex. All right. It's been a real treat to be on this uh, spin. The, what is, what is our morning with you? Hey, and we Thank hope to, yeah, hope to be able to uh, get you to New Zealand, to Aotearoa, New Zealand, one of these days. Um, yeah. Well, as, as I said at the beginning, I'm a tremendous admirer of New Zealand. And uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I send my blessings and, uh, and uh, pray for us. <laughs> <laughs> We will, we will. And uh, thank you to everyone who uh, joined in today on the call and your questions. Um, we'll be live again uh, in about four days with uh, Daniel Pinchbeck. Um, that will be on the 5th of June. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all uh, again then.
Sina, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, just just before we we end, end the call, um, we we find a lot of parallels with COSM and, and um, what you're doing over there with Earthbeat in New Zealand is providing a platform um, for upliftment and uh, transformation. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm curious if, if people felt called to um, contribute to the vision that you talked about at COSM. How can people um, find you online to, and how, how can people, what's the pathway for people to um, contribute to uh, the development of the, of the temple? Thank you so much. Uh, you can basically check out cosm.org, could uh, get you there, C-O-S-M dot O-R-G. And uh, if you're curious, thank you. Right. Okay, blessings Alex. All right. Take care, guys. Bye now.